Now the leader of the band, Mr. Ben Jaffe. Thank you all for uh, for joining us this evening um, or afternoon, well, whatever it is. Uh, my name is Dean Budnick, and I am the editor of Relics, and we are hosting this event, and we want to thank the museum for allowing us to, to, to be here and to do this, and we're going to have a wonderful panel with, with these two distinguished uh, individuals, and at the end, we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. We'll have them exchange some thoughts. I know that all of you here know who they are, but just for fun, I will, I will introduce the two of them. I mean, for people who are unaware, both Walter Isaacson and Ben Jaffe are New Orleans residents, Women's and in fact, graduates, yeah. <laughs> as I learn right. from, from Ben's mom, who is sitting right here in the second row and co-founded Preservation Hall, uh, Sandra Jaffe, um, they went to the same, uh, they, they were not at the same time, but they went to the same schools. So, uh, Walter Isaacson, it's right after now. After they changed the hair code that uh, Benji <laughs> got to go there. Right. Thankfully. Uh, I changed the hair code. Yes, right. yeah. <laughs> we salute you for that, sir. Uh, Walter Isaacson, again, uh, grew up in New Orleans, then went on to Harvard and Oxford. He is now back in uh, New Orleans, where he is a university professor at, of history at Tulane. He uh, is uh, former CEO of the Aspen Institute. He was the chairman of uh, CNN, the editor of Time, and has, wrote, has written a series of wonderful biographies of such individuals as Steve Jobs, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Ben Franklin, to name three. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? To his right, your left, Mr. Ben Jaffe, is the creative director of Preservation Hall Jazz Band and Preservation Hall, overseeing everything that goes on. Of course, it was founded by Ben's parents, uh, Alan, and again, Sandra, right there in 1961, I believe, and continues to thrive to this day. If you haven't seen the new documentary, uh, a, a Tuba to Cuba, it's a fascinating take on sort of the, the, the cultural connections between this region of the world and what, what's happening over there. And what I hope to do today is just talk a little bit uh, with the two of them about New Orleans and history and culture, and we'll see where all that goes. Let's start with, uh, let's start with Walter. Walter, can you just talk just a little bit about your connections with, with, with the Jaffe family and Prez Hall? Yeah, when I was growing up here, uh, as the 60s came along, New Orleans uh, was, uh, the jazz in New Orleans had sort of fallen down a bit. It had become sort of a Dixieland, honky-tonk type of thing. And the city was losing residents. It wasn't doing well. But in the early 60s, there were people who pushed civil rights and the revival of jazz. And the interesting thing is those two coincided, because Sandy and Al Jaffe took the Borenstein Art Gallery, started having jazz jam sessions, really. Even in the days, this is 1963, 64, was when the Civil Rights Acts and the other acts were passed. And she ends up getting arrested at one point by, and had to go before Judge Babylon. Two points? Come on up, come on up. <laughs> well, she, uh, because it was, the police were not quite clear what to do with a place in the French Quarter that was violating a lot of the social norms and some of the things. So that became a cause for a lot of us. I mean, we felt that both music and um, uh, politics were mixing. Now, all of you in this room, unfortunately, I can tell you, you can probably remember uh, the 60s and 70s when music and politics mixed. But for us growing up in New Orleans, it was really uh, mixed at Preservation Hall first. I'm curious on the other side. I mean, do you remember the first time that you crossed paths with uh, with Walter? Uh, Walter was already. I mean, my parents always spoke highly of Walter. I didn't know him growing up. I was born in '71. I believe you were gone by then. Um, yeah, I, just, I actually worked for the Picayune. Okay. And then left around. 
went to college in 71. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, 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 he was all, he, my parents would talk about him so much that I, I felt like I knew him, but. You hated me, yeah. Just, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the, the, the Preservation Hall Band did regular performances every summer in the New York area. Yeah. And I believe one time the band came by apartment. your apartment. Yeah, it was kind of cool. I mean, I kind of gotten to know uh, Sandy and Al, but you were off to Oberlin probably at some point. But they came up to New York, and we just had the entire band play in, I had a loft in Chelsea, which was then pretty cheap in New York. But it was really astonishing. I do remember one thing, which is Willie Humphrey, who was the um, cornet, uh, yeah, cl cl clarinetist, I'd made red beans and rice, and he said, only white people put celery in red beans and rice. <laughs> it's the only lesson I've remembered from that period. I still, yeah, to this what, day. What, what I, I do remember um, uh, after, after Hurricane Katrina, I was walking through the French Quarter, and a lot of people who knew me as a child had to um, meet me again as an adult. Uh, you know, as a kid, I was Benji. You know, they didn't know the, you know, the Ben Jaffe, the, you know, post-Katrina Ben. And uh, Walter was walking around the French Quarter with his daughter. Yeah. And uh, we just stopped and had a conversation. And you, what are you doing? And I started to fill you in on everything. And uh, we just began, I think, a, a new relationship. Uh, you know, he got to know what I was doing and the, the foundation. Well, you were doing amazing involved. things yeah. with the foundation right after the storm. And my father used to say that, well, my grandfather used to say you could know everything you need to know about a person by what side they supported in the Spanish Civil War. <laughs> and my father said you could know everything you needed to know by what side they were on in 1948 when Thurman walks out of Truman's Democratic Party. And for my generation, it was you can know everything about a person by how quickly they came back and what they did after the storm. And he did it with the hall, brought it back. But not only brought it back, brought the musicians back, found the musicians, and got them here. Walter, I was wondering if you, you know, if you could contextualize just a little bit the nature of what uh, Alan Sandy were doing early on. Again, as you mentioned, it's before the Voting Rights Act. It's before the Civil Rights Act when culture, uh, there wasn't the sort of oversight on a national level in terms of race relations and just really, truly how bold it was for them to, to initiate what, what they had done. Yeah, you have to go back uh, to the beginning of the century because jazz happens because of the racial mix and the sort of easy, not easiness, but the uh, complexity and grandeur of Creoles and foxtrot orchestras and sanctified church people and freed slaves coming from the plantation and drumming in Congo Square and then people coming back from the Spanish-American War and hawking their cornets with Jewish peddlers on what is now O.C. Haley and a, a Louis Armstrong getting one from the Karnofsky family. So racial and ethnic mix in this area from where Louis Armstrong was, which is Perdido Street to um, what is now Congo Square, that is what creates jazz. It's probably got more rivers flowing into it than the Mississippi. And when it gets uh, kind of diluted, which it did in the 50s, uh, it loses some of that. And then what happened in the 1960s is Sandy and Al, but others said, we have to have a revival of traditional jazz. And they found musicians. I mean, you found one of the great musicians for the hall was a janitor working at the time, right? Who was that? Punch Miller. Punch Miller. Why don't you take it from here? Because you remember Punch <laughs> Miller. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, my, my parents were... You know, in college in, in Philadelphia in the, in the 50s during the, the sort of New Orleans jazz revival. There was a, a whole jazz revival happening along the East Coast where, uh, and, and the West Coast as well. And they sort of got swept up in that. I mean, my mom belonged to a record club uh, where you used to pay a, a, a penny or a dime and her first records were the Louis Armstrong Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, you know, but 20, 30 years after they had already come out, you know. So when they came to New Orleans and, you know, first, you know, see the Eureka Brass Band and can't believe who they're seeing, you know, they go on this journey to, to, you know, bring these musicians back into, 
you know, out of retirement or just, you know, create a stage and a, a space where they, they can perform in a, um, in a, a different way than they had ever been, uh, you know, listened to and, and heard before, you know, where it wasn't, people weren't peddling drinks and it, uh, it kind of took them out of, you know, off of the street and in, in, in the, the parade fashion and put them on a stage. And that was very, very uh, progressive for the time. You know, not just politically progressive, but also artistically pro progressive. And your father, if I remember, played tuba in the Olympia Brass Band, integrating that band. And Harold Desjardins, who was the leader of the band, became your godfather, yeah. if I remember correctly. And I, I was just, I was just talking with someone the other day, just about the the timing of my parents' arrival in New Orleans. Um, it, now I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm getting older, and it's getting harder and harder to play three-hour parades. It's, it's really a, a, young, a young person's game. Uh, my parents arrived and I was looking at a lot of some photos the other day and I was noticing that my dad was in a lot of the brass bands. And he, the timing of when they came was right at this moment where uh, the older tuba, African-American tuba players in town had, were, weren't making the parades and there was a need for a tuba player. And my dad just kind of fit, like, arrived right at this moment. And, uh, you know, he was playing with the Eureka Brass Band, the Tuxedo, the Olympia Brass Band. And he sort of became a go-to tuba player um, for those first years until um, Tuba Fats came along and became, uh, you know, um, kind of came up underneath my dad. And then there was another wave of African-American tuba players. But for, a for there was a little window there where, where it was my dad, you know, was holding down the fort. Yeah. <laughs> Can, can you talk about the physical rigors, by the way, of lugging the, the tuba for three yeah. hours? What's, what's, that, what's that like? It's, uh, um, yeah, it's exhausting. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, 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 it weighs about 40 pounds. Um, it's, uh, you, you train for it. You don't, you know, are, are there tricks of the trade to uh, help you? Uh, there are not any tricks of the trade. Um, I mean... Uh, there's no way to train for it, really, either. There's no manual to, to get ready for this you you know, um, in life. It's better than string bass, which you also play. Yeah, I parade, picked the two biggest instruments. Yeah. <laughs> but tell the story of your uh, tuba getting stolen. Yeah, so I, I, I guess about uh, a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, my, after a show, uh, we were loading up our van. After a show in a, another part of town, um, we were playing at a wonderful place called uh, the Music Box. If you haven't been there, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, performance space. And uh, it's it's pretty dark back there. It was late at night, and nobody really noticed. Uh, you know, was paying close attention. And the next day, you know, the equipment got put away. And by Monday, we came back, and I showed up at the hall and was assuming that our tour manager had brought my tuba and it wasn't there. I said, oh, that's interesting. Okay, I went back and looked back at storage. It wasn't there. And then I had this sinking feeling immediately that it, that it had disappeared. And uh, sure enough, uh, you know, we all, do you have it? No, I don't have it. I don't have it. How, how do you lose a tuba? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, we, you know, we started putting out an APB for it very quietly. And uh, sure enough, within a, you know, within a couple of days, it was making headline news. It ended up in like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times on NPR. And we were, I was getting calls from musicians all over the world. You know, we'll help you get a new one. Da da da. And then we got a we got a message from somebody who actually was related to a trumpet player that played at Preservation Hall, who knew somebody who knew somebody who was a security guard <laughs> at a um, a like a metal yard over on the West Bank, and uh, and. Uh, no, they had brought it in. Someone had brought it in, and and uh, and he said, "No, we can't. You know, we can't take it." And uh, you know, we didn't ask too many questions. We just said, "Well, we just want it back." You know, and uh, we got it back, and it was, you know, amazingly. Well, I mean, and what did you do with the money that people had sent from all over the world? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Well, I, I, this is where the story turns beautiful. This is, this is where you turn lemons into lemonade. Um, I had received a message from Dave Matthews and just people from all over the world who, who were, you know, wanted to, to make a donation and wanted to get my horn back. And we happened to be at South by Southwest in Austin at the time of the, uh, those, um, those horrific uh, package bombs were going off. I don't know if, if, ever, if you yeah. recall that. And we were actually there at the moment 
that a young African-American tuba player, bass player, um, died as a result of one of these bombs. And I came to find out that he had just been accepted at Oberlin through my bass teacher. And uh, immediately it clicked in my mind. I said, oh my gosh, this outpouring of, of love from, all, from this music community, we, we, we created a Sousa fund at that moment. And uh, this past year we gave away three tubas to young African-American musicians here in New Orleans and one string bass. And we're gonna keep doing that every year. I remember being at the hall yes. when you gave them out a few months ago. Three, yeah, a, a young female and a two male. In fact, as soon as I gave, I, the one tuba player took it, tried it out, took a picture, and ran down the street and he had a gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can always get work as a tuba player, as your dad knew. <laughs> tell me about, tell, I'm sorry to take it <laughs> over, but there's, um, to get back to a slightly, to a sad part, but also something that brought this city together in an astonishing way. It's the first time I had really, somebody asked me, maybe you earlier today asked me about, when did you first focus on jazz funerals? And I think it was your father's jazz funeral, which was a staggering event in this city. It was, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, jazz funerals, particularly at that time, my father passed away in 1987. And it, uh, it, it really is uh, an African-American tradition in a way that, that you know, members of social aid and pleasure clubs and, and churches honor their, their members and p members of the community. And uh, that was really the first time, you know, in my lifetime where, where, you know, the whole, where I felt the whole city come out to honor somebody. It was, it was overwhelming, uh, the amount of love and, you know, loss that was felt. Uh, because you know, even though he was the, the captain of Preservation Hall, you know he was instrumental in um, in starting Jazz Fest as well, and putting the, the first board of directors together, and you know George Ween on his first trip to New Orleans to to determine whether or not we could actually have a Jazz Fest stayed at our house. Um, my father became sort of a you know a creative you know um, partner to George, and and that had a racial component too. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, well, I'm I don't know if George is here, uh, but uh, I'll. Yeah, I know he's in New Orleans. Uh, yeah, he told me, well, he's, he, George is Jewish, his wife is African American, and he came down and he's staying at, the, at our house, and he, you know, he's, my dad and you know, these other business leaders have this idea of creating a Newport style folk jazz festival in New Orleans, and uh, George says, yeah, this is, your, this is a prime you know, location to, to create something like this, but you know, I can't, ask a Duke Ellington, a Miles Davis, a Dizzy Gillespie, a Mahalia Jackson, and Ella Fitzgerald to stay at a different hotel from, you know, than the white artists that are playing here. They, you know, they have to be able to eat at the same restaurants. They have to be able to stay at the same hotels. They have to be treated with the same respect and dignity. And, uh, you know, I think he was on his way to City Hall and he, he stopped and talked to my dad. He said, you know, that's not really, that's not my burden. That's your, your the community's burden. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it took several years for them to, I think George's first trip here was in 64, 65. And then the first Jazz Fest, I believe, was 69. That's why we're on our 50th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he walked, it was five years. He walked away and said, it, it, I just can't do this until, until yeah. things change. Well, he, and, 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 yeah, and, then, and, and so not only did, you know, it was Preservation Hall, yes, but, you know, people don't realize that that was like the next wave of energy that my parents put into the, into the community was, was getting the, the, the city ready to, you know, take on this, this you know, tremendous... Uh, task of putting on something that is truly representative of, of our city. Well, Trump here is. Can, can you r recall your your early live music experiences? Here? Well, yeah. I mean, my first live music experiences were at the Hall. It opens in '61, and uh, fortunately, the drinking age was 18 back then, and <laughs> you usually could, yeah, 16 if you had a fake ID. Although I, when I was 16, I looked about 12. But so we'd come down to the corner, but you could come to the hall because it didn't serve alcohol. And so I, we would go, Tom Cowan, Jimmy Smith, myself, Phelps Gay, all my friends from Newman, we'd come down to the hall on Friday and Saturday nights. It wasn't that hard to get into back then. I mean, this is, you know, the late 60s. And I remember the first Jazz Fest because that, as you say, was 69 and I was still... Uh, and. Arthur Davis, who's the father of Quint, and my father 
were part. He was an architect. My father's an engineer, and they were building the Superdome together and stuff. So all of a sudden, he's like, "Meet this guy. He's starting a jazz fest." And it was out in what we used to call Beauregard Square, which is then becomes Armstrong Park, then Congo Square. And that was, I remember going to the very first one. Boy, I wish I had pictures, too. Because, you know, we, uh, everybody in my generation lies about being at Woodstock. <laughs> but I wasn't at Woodstock. But I was at that first um, um, New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival in July 69, I guess it was. In Man, do you remember your first exper- Jazz Fest experience? Uh, well, I, I, I don't. I mean, it's kind of like asking me my first memory of Preservation Hall. You know, you grow up with something, yes. and you're just always there. So I don't. I mean, I have memories of, of just always being on the grounds. I mean, my, my earliest memories are out at the fairgrounds, um, probably starting around the late '70s. You know, when I started becoming uh, aware of what was going on, and my dad would take me with him down to the president at night to go see the night shows because he was on the board of directors. So, and I always wanted to be around the music. You know, um, so I, wherever he was going, I was always game to go. And that was when the, the president was down at Spanish Plaza. Um, and then and there were also shows at, at the Municipal Auditorium back then, the night shows. It wasn't like it is today where there's, you know, shows all over town that go on at, you know, midnight and 12 a.m. I mean, 2 a.m. Um, there was usually like, you know, a, a night show at the Municipal Auditorium and then a show over at the at, on the boat at the president. And it would be like Alan Toussaint yeah. and Jesse Hill and... Um, Ernie Cato and uh, Oliver who shot the La La Morgan, um, Fats Domino. I mean, I remember being backstage and um, uh, what was the name of, the, of, the, of the, the gentleman who wore the robes? Ernie Cato? No. no. Um, oh. Mike, Mike Stark. Yeah. Mike Stark, Mike Stark. Okay, he, Mike Stark had a mask factory. He used to make masks in the French Quarter and was a one of the French Quarter characters. And, and he also did um, uh, Dr. John's costumes. Oh. And uh, he was backstage, and um, uh, Dr. John was having trouble getting his costume on, and uh, they had to just they had to staple it onto his pants. <laughs> They had that, like all, all like all of the Indian feathers up and down. And I just I, I was just I you know I was watching this like take place. I must have been like nine or ten years old, just being backstage, you know. You're just a fly on the wall kind of watching this. All. That's where he got his fashion sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing, that you mentioned that. Okay, so Mike Stark, wore, he was a, uh, a minister, and he wore uh, these big flowy robes and was a, a huge, huge person, bigger than life, and bald, big beard, and was friends with Odetta. And uh, I remember him, um, yeah, he, he stopped me because uh, I, I, I've always sort of dressed like this and we were walking through the French Quarter with my dad I must have been about 12 or 13 probably coming from the president and uh, Mike, Mike stopped me and made a comment about my clothes and, and I was thinking to myself y- coming from you you're talking about Mike yeah, right. yeah, t- <laughs> <laughs> did you dress like that at Newman during the day um, you know yeah oh. I <laughs> I didn't start at Newman. I started at McDonough 15, yeah, no. Plessy, in the French Quarter. So when I went uptown to Newman, um, I sort of brought like that whole downtown swag with me. Um, you know, I grew up with Alan Tucson, and you know, uh, yeah. you know, you know, we grew up with Deacon John and the Ivories yeah. or something. <laughs> that bad fashion <laughs> sense. Uh, you know, hold on one second. So. Oh, look at ben, ben on the cover of uh, of the latest issue of. Uh, he's fetching, is he not? Uh, <laughs> Sandra, he looks great on the. Uh, oh, he looks he looks delightful. Uh, but my point is this: so I, I interviewed Ben uh, in, in this in this issue. Pick it up; it's a great magazine, by the way. Uh, and uh, and you know, Mr. Magazine himself, he's already he, you know Walter took a look and he's, he gave us the thumbs up. So we're. We're happy it's actually it. an incredibly well-designed magazine. Congratulations. Thank you. And Thank you. I assume well-written, but I've only <laughs> seen it for the past 20 minutes. So, right, aside from all that great opportunity to pat myself uh, on the back or vis-a-vis uh, uh, Walter, my, during the course of my interview with Ben, I asked him about representations of jazz funerals. I grew up in New England in the 1970s. And growing up, I told him uh, there, was, there was a film, and that was the first time I had ever seen a jazz funeral. And he stopped me, and he said, wait, wait, wait. It was one of two movies I know for a fact. And do you want to share? You said it was one or the other. Yeah, I, I said it was either Cincinnati Kid or To Live and Let Die, uh, James Bond. 
And yeah. it it was To Live and Let Die, right? It was on probably ABC, 1970, whatever, right after uh, Roger Moore took over the gig. And can you talk about, you know, talk about that scene and who who's in that scene for people uh, who aren't aware? Well, I mean, the movie opens um, on, on Charters, right? A block uh, before you get to Jackson Square. And it's the... It's the Olympia Brass Band marching down the street, and it's a it's a, a jazz funeral's taking place, and uh, a gentleman walks up to Alvin Alcorn, the trumpet player, on the street, and he says he says uh, what's going on? He said oh it's a fu-. he said oh it's a funeral. He said whose funeral? And then Alvin Alcorn has a knife in his hand and he goes yours. It's a great moment. It's awesome. I mean yeah. You know. So. <laughs> and then and then and then. The band passes and they take the casket out and they put it over him on the street and lift it up and he's gone. You know? and, then they, and they continue down the street and then, then the, the music picks up and everybody starts dancing and it's, you know, the movie carries on. But uh, I knew Alvin Alcorn. I mean, uh, I remember uh, when I had a, a school project, my dad sent me down to the Marriott because they used to play in the lobby at the Marriott. He had a little trio that played in the lobby of the Marriott and he smoked cigars. And I needed cigar boxes for an insect project that I was doing. <laughs> so he sent me down to, you know, I walked down to, to the Marriott. Um, and yeah, I walked in and, you know, Mr. Alcorn saw me and he, you know, stopped playing, put his trumpet down, ran in the back, came back with three boxes and gave them to <laughs> me. <Yeah. laughs> so they, these are all people I knew. And my dad just, my dad just, lo- I mean, it was, it was just one of the greatest uh, things like my dad would always get so excited recounting that scene. You know, he loved that. He says, "Yours." Ah. Yeah. <laughs> it was striking growing up. I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." Yeah, I was like eight years old, I think, maybe when I saw that. I, Walter, can you just talk about representations of New Orleans and popular culture and how you viewed them uh, as you were growing up, and then you know left here and went out in the world? Is there anything that were particular striking to you, or offended you, or? You know, you were enamored. No, with? I actually uh, first got interested in the representation of culture in books and literature. I remember I had somebody we called an uncle, meaning he had married in the family, Walker Percy, and we couldn't figure out what Walker Percy did because you know, saying to Anne, his daughter, man, your dad's always sitting at home all day, you know, drinking bourbon and eating hogshead cheese. He said, well, he's a writer. And I go, you know, and I knew you could be a fisherman. I knew you could be an engineer. I knew you could be a doctor. I didn't know you could be a tuba player or a writer. So, and then the moviegoer comes out. And, um, I, you know, most of you wouldn't have heard. I mean, it's, it did win the National Book Award. It is the greatest novel. I still reread it every couple of years. And it was astonishing to me, the moviegoer, because it's about Gentilly and the Elysian Fields bus and then walking through the quarter. And to me, that's the best representation in literature. I mean, obviously, you have Streetcar Named Desire and many other such things. But to me, that gave me a sense of, oh, I get it. I'm growing up in a town that's actually a little bit weird and a little bit odd. And this guy who lives in the suburbs comes on in and sees it. And so I became very interested in how New Orleans is portrayed in literature, starting way back with uh, George Washington Cable, Lefkady O'Hearn, which is, by the way, all about race, just like jazz was. It was about, uh, I mean, one of the grandest themes for example, a George Washington Cable book, I think somebody will correct me, in the 1890s or something. But it's about two brothers, one, uh, full brothers actually, but one passing as white and one passing, not passing, but one who was living as a Creole of color. Because that's around the time they draw the color line again when Plessy v. Ferguson comes along. So watching the evolution of New Orleans and how it dealt with race over the decades has been my interest. In terms of movies, I'll let you take it over because I love DZ Rider and a few others, yeah. but I'm not, a, you, you're probably more familiar with the movie genre. No, yeah. I mean, Easy Rider is definitely, I mean, definitive. Um, Cincinnati Kid is a great one as well. A lesser known, uh, one of my favorites, Down by Law with uh, Tom Waits, is a, even though New Orleans is, you know, just the first, maybe third of the movie. Um, what did you think of Treme? I, I liked it. I, I loved it, but I, I, I couldn't watch it. Yeah. It was a, it was. I mean, I lived it, so it was, mm-hmm. it was just too uh, painful. Oh, oh. I could watch parts of it, and then it would just, I would, I would have to, to walk away from it. Yeah. But, 
Yeah. People always ask, was that authentic? You would know better than I. It was, but it was painfully the, authentic. Yeah, I yeah. was about to say, uh, yeah. It was yeah. like so authentic that, I remember Wendell Pierce, and you even know who he is, he was, I think plays trombone yeah. in that, right? Not quite trombone shorty, but plays. And um, I remember we had a whole discussion. I mean, it got very serious about the politics because he lived in Pontchartrain Park, Gentilly, where the part we said by Walker Prescott. And they were trying to get one of the KIPP charter schools, like you is a KIPP school that you had been to, you know, that, yeah. And he, we were trying to start the schools again. But then um, Simon, David Simon, wrote in a thing into the into second season of Treme about how charter schools were hurting the city. And this is Wendell playing the role in art making. I said, wait a minute. You're trying to get, you know, trying to have your own charter in Pontchartrain Park so you can run your own school, but you're saying this. And then we talked about it, and the plot line changed. So I was, I mean, because Wendell talked to him about it. I was just surprised at how authentic every even minor argument, including the chefs, including, right. you know, uh, uh, Patois is in there, I think. Yeah. Everything seemed right to me, and I don't mean that it was sugar-coated. It was so right it made me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. It, uh, in fact, uh, last night, uh, Steve Earle uh, played with us at Preservation Hall, and uh, yeah, he... Uh, He's a character in the movie. He's a, a busker and uh, who's, you know, uh, ends up being being murdered in sort of a senseless robbery. Uh, but you know, Steve only gets involved in projects that he believes in, and that was something that he believed in. And and it's a, it's a. I, I think someday I will go back and watch it. And I I believe that you know when someone wants to understand the storm, the aftermath of the storm, I send them to, to that to Treme. It's it's. I mean, how do you explain New Orleans? You can't. It's uh in in in. You know, it's 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 almost impossible. And I believe that you know Treme has did the best job of any, any you know any attempt that's ever been made to, you know, peel away all of these these complicated layers. So I'm curious. Without talking about Cajun food, which I know is a sore spot for some people, uh, Walter in particular. <laughs> well, no, no, not not the food itself, but the. Uh, <laughs> I guess that uh, you, you know, Cajun food is not was not born in New Orleans, and right, you were saying that on the road, everyone Ben, everyone wants to take you out to a Cajun restaurant, and you have to explain, well, that's not precisely how I grew up. Is that? <laughs> oh wait, we're having a crawfish boil, you know, in your place now and then. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like. I mean, I think it is useful to make a distinction between Cajun and Creole food. I mean, they're quite different, uh, but they're both good. Um, the New Orleans food that's very authentic is obviously Creole because, to me, it has the same mix as jazz. I mean, you, you could take the Baquet family, for example. D Dean is obviously editor of the New York Times. Uh, Achille, ba Achille ba Baquet, the great-grandfather, played with Jimmy Durante and actually, when they went to Los Angeles, crossed the color lines. Uh, but... Others, uh, Little Dizzy and uh, Old Man Baquet had Creole restaurants. So I think that mix of different social, ethnic, and racial groups that goes into jazz almost simultaneously goes into the creating of New Orleans Creole food. Yeah, uh, you know, the, actually speaking of movies, it was The Big Easy. Right, right, right. That's what I was thinking of when you were walking through films. Yeah, when I was walking, and as you said it, and Angel Heart's another great New Orleans movie, too, if anybody hasn't seen Angel Heart. That's another great New Orleans movie. Um, the Big Easy has a good soundtrack. The Big Easy's got a great soundtrack, but it, it, you know, from that moment forward, everybody assumed that that's how we talked, <laughs> and, and New Orleans just became, you know, blackened this and blackened that, you know, and of course, like, you know, everybody loves Kate Paul's, you know, but it is Cajun. Um, and uh, and we don't you know we don't all say share and you know we talk like we're from Lafayette. I mean, um, and it, it, it's just it, it's 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 funny. It's like you know it, you know in New Orleans people you know say well I'm not you know I'm from uptown I'm from downtown and you know but we'll all agree that there's you know that you know that there's a, a distinction between our French culture in New Orleans and the French culture the Cajun French culture of, of yeah. you know Southwest Louisiana. More yeah. people in New Orleans talk like. Um, Brando as Stanley Kowalski in Streetcar, then talk, like Brooklyn, like yeah, yeah, then yeah. talk like um, whatever the Big Easy, uh, yeah. whoever it was. Yeah. 
Uh, Dennis Quaid, right? I yeah, think it was Dennis Quaid. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned Steve Earle. In, in terms of what you do now at Prez Hall, you've collaborated with My Morning Jacket, An Arcade Fire, Dave Matthews, a number of artists. Can you talk uh, sort of about you know that dynamic in terms of maintaining a lineage and a tradition and sort of bringing things you know, in, into the present and on into the future? How, how do you approach that? Um, yeah, what well, a lot of that started... Uh, immediately after Hurricane Katrina and I made my way I was here for the hurricane and eventually got out of the city and then um, made my way actually to Lafayette and then in, once in Lafayette I drove to New York uh, and then reconvened my band after I could look after I located everybody back into to New York where we could get housing and um, there was immediate there was this immediate outpouring of love uh, from the music community, and there was uh, one concert specifically, the Big Apple to the Big Easy, uh, that took place at Madison Square Gardens and at Radio City Music Hall on the same night. Uh, the Madison Square Gardens show, I think, was like you know Elton John and Paul McCartney, and then the Radio City Music Hall show was like Fish and Ivan Neville and Galactic. And um, at that time, they didn't know what to do with Preservation Hall. So they were like, can you guys play in the lobby when, as people are walking in? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, 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 you know, just get us, you know, like we just need, we just want to be there, you know? Um, and actually that was the night, uh, so Radio City Music Hall donates all of the, their services and all of the, the, the union donates all of their time. So it's a, it's a bare bones staff working the event. So there's no security. It's very, very bare bones. And we're, everybody's sound checking and rehearsing the day before. And, uh, you know, being this, the son of Sandra Jaffe, um, I, I know how to get backstage pretty easily. And, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I know, I know my way around. Um, and I met this photographer that night, Danny Clinch, uh, that night. And Danny just came up and introduced himself to me. And then that afternoon, I was standing there and I saw, um, uh, like, who, gosh, who did I see come through the door? I saw um, Elvis Costello show up. And then I saw, uh, you know, he was holding the door open for Tom Waits. And, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of speechless at that point. And, you know, Dave Matthews shows up. And then, you know, the, the guys from Fish show up. And, you know, I'm, I'm, and they're just, they're hugging me and thanking me. And, you know, they can't do enough. And, and I, I never really felt that outpouring of love from the greater music community. You know, all these people had this, this uh, deep, deep appreciation and understanding of how important New Orleans is. And that was a pivotal moment that night. You know, um, all those musicians on that stage that night became supporters of ours and, and, and friends and collaborators, um, for, you know, since, since that moment. Um, so uh, the idea of collaboration really almost happened that night. It, it 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 wasn't about necessarily, you know, having all these bands play New Orleans music. They already loved New Orleans music. Uh, it was it was just about finding where we all intersected. Like where was that where was that 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 point of intersect musical intersection? And when you work with a great collaborator, you're learning as much as you're giving. So you're learning from them, as they're learning from you. And you know, that's the most beautiful moments. Um, you know, though, when New Orleans music, as I said, has so many rivers flowing into it, and what's happened at the Hall under your leadership is you've added more strands to it, starting with the Haitians and Arcade Fire, and it inflected your music. Yeah, I think you have a whole album out that's, you know, Haitians. And then you did the trip to Cuba, which did it. And that's important because Haitians and Cubans are two of the most important ethnic groups and the 200, I mean, New Orleans is 300 years, but for the past 250 years, they've been two of the most important. And putting that into the press hall music has been nice, too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's it, I mean, thank you. Um, it's been a, a beautiful artistic journey. You know, I, one of the things that, that I believe is that, you know, as, as a, an artist, you're constant, you, you're on your own journey, you're on your own musical journey and evolution throughout life. And you have to, you know, um, go on your own exploration. And part of that for us has been going to Cuba, has been going to Haiti, has been sort of discovering our roots, you know, um, the roots of New Orleans music. And uh, when you think about it, I mean, New Orleans jazz really was, I mean, one of the first, like, you know, what I would call like world musics, 
you know, if you think about it, I mean, yes, it's distinctively New Orleans, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's African, you know, it's, it's Spanish, it's French, it's, uh, you know, has uh, all of those things. Caribbean. Caribbean, yes. I mean, it, all of those things are, are present in the music. And, you know, if that happened today, we would call it world music. Um, Another thing you did that I thought that was real interesting is in terms of indigenous American music, is you did, you, did, uh, you recorded and toured with uh, Del McCory. So you're bringing together sort of jazz and bluegrass. Can you ta just talk a little bit about how that came about and, and to the extent to which you know, those two uh, modes of music meld? Uh, I mean, we really didn't know if that was going to work or not. Yeah. You know, we really didn't know if uh, we were going to, like, if there was any, like, common ground where bluegrass and, and, and jazz, like, overlapped. And I was, I was, I'm willing to give it a shot. You know, like, let, let's see if this happens. You know, if, let, let's get together and meet in a room play music, get to know each other, have some crawfish, have a beer, you know, hang out for a little while and see if, see if, if there's something there. Don't, don't force it to happen, just allow it to happen, you know? Um, and the first thing that I noticed that just from talking with them is Del McCurry's uncle played with Bill Monroe and then got Del McCurry the job and then Del McCurry got his son the job and then his son and his brother and their children. I'm like, oh wow, there's like four or five generations. Oh, this is like New Orleans. Okay, well, this isn't happening anywhere else. I mean, it happens in gospel music. It happens in New Orleans and jazz and it happens in bluegrass. Okay, so there's some common ground and then we start playing. I'm listening to the instruments and the first thing Charlie recognizes is Charlie Gabriel, our clarinet player. He's going to be 87 this summer. He notices that the violin is the same register as the clarinet. And that's the first thing he notices. So him and the clarinet, it's him and the violin player go step over to the side and they're just, they're like trading solos together and they're showing each other things. Okay, so that's happening in one side, that's happening over in that corner, right? Then I notice the banjo player is doing something on the banjo and I'm like, what's he doing? And our drummer goes, oh, he's, he's, he's playing this. And I always the the banjo is, a, is really a, a percussion instrument. You know, people think it's a like a yeah, it does play chords, but it's really a percussion instrument. You know, and it, it's it's African. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, so there's the drummer. You know, and obviously I know what the bass player does, and we actually do the same thing. He just he accents a different beat than we do in New Orleans. So he's like. He goes, dick a doom, 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 dick a doom. And then New Orleans, we go, doom, dick a doom, dick a doom, dick a doom. So he's, he's going, dick a, when I'm doing doom, and I'm doing doom when he's doing dick a. <laughs> like, we're just like, we're like, you know? And if you think about it, that's like, that's how people clap. Like, that's the difference in clapping. Like, in New Orleans, like, in New Orleans you know, it's like, nah. da, 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 and when they play it, like when they play the Saints go marching and they go, da, 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 da. There's something to be said for the backbeat. Yes. <laughs> I don't have to say what you all already know. Um, there are not a lot of African American bluegrass musicians. Um, but once we started figuring this all out, the son comes up to me and he goes, well, hang on, do you guys know um, a song called The Muhlenberg Blues? <laughs> wow. And I said, no, but we know the Muhlenberg Blues, or the Muhlenberg Joys. He goes, uh, can you play it? And uh, we start playing it, and he goes, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I said, oh, that's the Muhlenberg Joys. He goes, no, that's the Muhlenberg Rag, or something. I said, what? He goes, yeah, Bill Monroe wrote that. I said, oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's you know, he said, what are you? I said, well, and then um, Del McCurry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time, but you asked a question. Uh, Del McCurry comes up to me and he goes, you know, Bill used to tell me that there was this banjo player that used to come up from New Orleans and used to teach him all these songs. And they just walked away. You know, I was like. <laughs> so. That's how the Muhlenberg, the Muhlenberg Joys became the Muhlenberg Blues and became a bluegrass standard. So, you know, there's no direct, there's no path or road to all this. And then we ended up recording it together. Oh, wow. You know, you know um, Ken Barnes in September is coming out with country music, the new, and it's a little bit like what he did with Wenton Marsalis and jazz, yeah. but Wenton and others helped him make the connection like you did 
between jazz and country music. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll also, I mean, think about what jazz musicians have been doing throughout history, taking um, Broadway music or taking popular songs and just, you know, in, in, in music culture today, we call it remixing, you know? Oh, we're going to do a remix. We're going to do an EDM remix. We're going to do a, a deep house remix. We're going to do a hip hop remix. We're going to do a reggae remix. Back then it was just, oh, let's just do, let's put a foxtrot on this song and it becomes a New Orleans jazz standard, you know, um, Lady Be Good or uh, Hello Dolly. And, you know, and then Miles Davis does it. And, you know, they, it, it's part of our, I mean, it's not new. None of this is new. It's new to us, you know, but it's none of it's new. Drop the mic. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I thought maybe. Well, actually, Walter. Ask us some, yeah. Yeah, that's what, oh, that's what I was going to say. I was going to open it up to questions. Ask us some questions. People have questions? Yeah. New Orleans. I got yeah. questions. Yeah. I, I always remember the year, sometime between 61 and 68, when I was preparing for law school, that I got involved with you guys on a, a law student game. An ordinance. Was, they were trying to shut you down. Talk to her. Yeah. Hey, Sandy. Come here, Sandy. <laughs> Yeah, it was Judge Babylon. Uh, you're drinking enough. You'll be okay. Yeah, and so she gets in front of Judge Babylon. I'm sorry. Great. Truly, Walter, I would love to speak and, there's, and answer anything, dear, but I can't. I'm having. Okay, I'll tell the story then. Right. You, just, you tell me yes or no. <laughs> Actually, we just. We, um, the hall never had a music license. Right. It, was, it was a gallery, it was, a, it was an artist collective. And uh, throughout the 1950s, if you went into what became Preservation Hall, there, was, uh, there were artists living upstairs, there was a photographer, Dan Lear, originally Pops Weitzel, had his photo studio in the back. Um, there was a framing shop, there was artists who would come in and paint, and the idea was that people would come in during the daytime and you could actually experience an artist studio and watch artists at work and, and engage with artists and have them talk to you kind of like what goes out on Jackson Square but in a, a more of a gallery setting and uh, the idea was well if we have musicians come and sit for us then they're coming in as models you know so there's a little bit of you know a little hustle going on you know what I'm saying it's like a little a little New Orleans so it's not really really clear what's going on here you know <laughs> But it's okay because every, everybody's, it's all in, you know, good fun and nobody's, you know, until somebody, you know, calls about, you know, the noise coming from next door and uh, tries to shut it down, you know. So um, um, I don't specifically know about that moment. But, uh, but by the time, I mean, what happened was, what year was it, Mom, that, that, um, that the Brinkley Report came and did the, the, the piece on the hall? 62? So shortly after my parents officially opened what became Preservation Hall, uh, the Brinkley News Hour came down and did a piece on Preservation Hall. And that was you know, prior to 60 Minutes, and this is when there was two or three channels. So every, everybody was watching this one moment, and they did a special. So all of a sudden, Preservation Hall was on the national you know, consciousness. And that immediately changed everything. It was almost as if they could do whatever they wanted at that point. Um, uh, you know, because you know, who would dare, you know, do something to to you know take away something that you know everybody everybody's you know oh what an amazing thing this is incredible you know nobody wanted to be that fool. Right. To this day. Yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, um, it's, it's really fascinating to see how history and music really come together. I would love to hear from you about that intersection. Like in your case, I love it that you literally have all this history that you've just lived through. And I would love to know from Walter if he listens to any music and if he likes it. <laughs> Uh, I, I've only I've only come to appreciate my life as as I've gotten older and traveled more and 
met people and uh one thing that we all talk about and if you're from new orleans one of the things we talk about and it didn't occur to a lot of us until katrina uh that you know play you know when you end up in a place like houston or baton rouge or atlanta or any city where there was where a lot of uh new orleans ended up it was unbelievable to them that there was no music there was no like live right. music happening in all, all the time the just so that you know in new orleans hey let's hey let's go to the maple leaf hey let's go to you know the tips let's go to, hey we'll, we'll go down to the hall we'll go to frenchman street well hey there's a parade there's a second line there's this going on there's that going on hey offbeat what's happening seven nights a week there's always a decision you have to make you know um <laughs> and the other thing that, that that we all like for for like i mean the entire population no one could believe that um, a bar would close. <laughs> that was just like, that was like, I mean, it's one of those things that we just, you don't even think about when you live here or they, that you can't like take your drink with you or show up with a drink. Like, it, it's, it's, I mean, you know, it really is, I know. It, it, it's, Weird. It, it, it can't, I, it, it's hard for me to even understand. I mean, because people, we, we think the rest of the world is strange, <laughs> you know, uh, for that. And that was that was really when when it really began. It, it wasn't just something people said to me. It was it really became part of my like awareness of how special this place is, and just how important it is, and how important the people are that live here, and how important the the the, the communities and neighborhoods are, and that this is important. It's not just important to us. It's I mean this is a model for for what's right. You know, I mean, more places, I wish more places were like this, you know? It's a model for what's right in the sense that we really try to face at all times the mix of people and that that mix makes us stronger and more interesting. In terms of what I listen to, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm i now such a geek. I have Alexa, <laughs> I have Alexa, you know, and Amazon, and I've trained it, so I have a New Orleans funk thing and it has an entire playlist that probably 70 songs of just everything for the Neville brothers but it's all but the main thing I listened to when we moved back here a few years ago I'd always kept a place here but Kathy and I moved to the 800 block of Royal Street we have a, and you can walk by you can see there's a balcony right there on the second floor and people always say isn't it noisy there and I go yeah man it is so noisy it's so great <laughs> Because there's always a second, like, because people get married in the Ursuline Convent or the cathedral, and then they got to go to Brennan's or whatever to have that. And they always, it's like five or six times a evening, there'll be a parade in the second line, and then there's just parades at all times. And so the ability just to keep your windows open and sit on that balcony and know that there's always going to be a parade marching through and uh, Kathy knows, not just because I like Ben, but because I like tubas. She'll call out, it's a two-tuba parade. Get on out here. <laughs> yep. I, I wanted to ask if, if the somewhat relentless crush of so many different people in here in New Orleans is what has relaxed and loosened the, the rules. Yeah, I'll start if you want. You know, you talk about Pres Hall, Preservation Hall and music and all helping push integration in the 60s. But a lot of things did that, including you ought to get, we ought to give Moon Landrieu and some of the leaders at a certain point shout out. But the New Orleans Saints did that as well. I mean, in the NFL, when you decided you wanted the Saints and you wanted a Super Bowl, my grandfather, most of you are from here, used to take me to the NOAC, the New Orleans Athletic Club on Rampart, which I didn't quite notice but was you know, in the 60s, pretty much segregated. Now it's the greatest racial diversity. And I asked Bill, the guy who runs it, what happened? He says, when the Saints came, we realized that we had to have Saints players there and it integrated. So i am always got my antenna up for things that help make us a city that sort of brings people together rather than do what the rest of the nation is doing, which is becoming more divisive and polarized. Um, a lot of people coming in help to do that as well. But to me, the more interesting people coming in are not, you know, the Carnival Cruise Line that just docked near my apartment and they're all coming in. 
But the different waves of people who come in, including after the storm, I know that this country is sort of some places having allergic reactions about, you know, Mexican invaders, as our president would say. But we watched our city get rebuilt, and we watched then the food and everything else get rebuilt and stuff by people who came in after the storm. And I'm part of a group that tries to help bring this together in some ways. There's a young Vietnamese guy on it. I hope he's not here. He's like 28. And we were talking about the Vietnamese culture, what it had done, and a few other things. And then he started complaining. He said, it was, it was last Mardi Gras, he said, well, all these people are coming in, and they're all ruining the king cake. And I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, well, king cakes. They're now doing things like putting strawberries in the king cake. You're not supposed to put strawberries in the king cake. They've screwed up the king cakes. Now this is a guy in his 20s who had come with the fall of Saigon, and he's worried that the newcomers are messing up the king cakes. And that's what I love about New Orleans is not only do we get waves of new people, but each new wave says, oh man, they're having a second line, they shouldn't do that. Or, oh man, they're messing up the king cake. So I like the new waves. I even like strawberries and the king cake now. <laughs> yeah? I know, I know. I, I, I think I could, I, you don't want to get into an argument over this, but <laughs> Vietnamese bakeries have, and they've reinvented the po' boy. I mean, you know, the Vietnamese po' All boy. All the po' boy bread comes from. Leitemeyer's, you mean? No. You no, know, now from the Vietnamese yeah. bakery. I know. So everything that happens here is because newcomers come here, and we have to avoid, with all due respect to this friend from Vietnam, not to be like the rest of the country and complain, oh, they're messing up our place. Yes. Good yeah, uh, yeah. A uh, so uh, a sousaphone is a tuba. Uh, a tuba is a, a family of instruments, and if you uh, if anybody's been to see a symphony orchestra play, the instru the large instrument that sits in your lap, the bell goes straight up. It doesn't go around your neck; it goes straight up. Yeah, that's that's a tuba. Uh, what happened was John Philip Sousa needed an instrument that his band could march with. And he created the Sousa phone, John Philip Sousa. And what's the difference between a cornet and a trumpet, and why did Louis Armstrong make the switch? Do you know the answer? I know the answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they taught what? us at Newman. <laughs> we know cornet versus trumpet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a, a cornet is a it's it has so instruments are so a sousaphone and a tuba if have the, the same amount of tubing uh metal tubing which I, I believe is 27 feet of tubing so that's why they're in, in the same they're both b flat instruments and the cornet and the trumpet are both uh the same essentially the same instrument but a cornet is shrunken so it has more of a uh, the timbre is different. It's it's the same pitch. Uh, they read the same music, but the actual tone that comes out of the instrument is, is different. The bell on a cornet's a little bit smaller than a trumpet. So a tr uh, than a trumpet, a trumpet's a little darker than a trumpet. A trumpet's um, uh, I, I guess it almost it's like the difference between like a pea shooter and a, I don't know. BB gun. Yeah. Yeah. BB gun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> bad bad analogy. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> But the cornet, the the the, the trumpet, the, the cornet, uh, like uh, there were there were two different styles of clarinet as well. There was a um, uh, the style of clarinet that George Lewis and Willie Humphrey played. That 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 was technically what's that an A flat horn? Um, th there's another name for it too. I can't. An Albert system. There's a, an Albert system clarinet. It had a very difficult fingering system, and as technology. Uh, it, you know, as advances in technology came along, they were able to uh, simplify the fingering. And that, so there's a, a new clarinet started appearing in New Orleans jazz in the 50s. And the same thing with the trumpet. The trumpet kind of took over the, the, the cornet and the, 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 
Banff system clarinet sort of took over for the Albert system clarinet and gradually the sound of music started changing and the technique started changing and evolving. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. <laughs> so, hey, actually, I have a question for, I have a question for, sorry. I have a question for Walter. So, w when you came back here, uh, you know, after being away, what was the most dramatic cultural, historical, architectural change that you noticed as you... Well, that the city was still here. And I, I mean that seriously because the first time I... I mean, I never really left. My family home has always been here on Napoleon Avenue. I kept an apartment in the quarter. But I first came home uh, about a week after the storm because I had been made by, by the governor vice chair of the recovery, Louisiana Recovery Authority. And what we first had to do was get people back. And I remember circling, and this is not going to be a Brian Williams story because I checked it with uh, Sarah Usden who was on the, the, the helicopter with me because we, we could see water. And my home on Napoleon Avenue was under eight feet and it was... And we thought, man, this city, both of us were crying because we thought, all right, that's it. It's been great, but it's gone. And nobody was back for a while. We ended up getting a sort of come home New Orleans party that M went in Marsalis and some others helped us do to try to get people home. But I thought, okay, this is going to be tough. We may not make it. And then... Over the course of four or five years, it, it was partly the music. It was, you all brought the hall back, other people. We, it took a while to get even the Nevilles back, some of them did. But the restaurant owners were the first to come back. Um, Paul Prudhomme. I remember Paul Prudhomme on Charter Street. That restaurant was open within six days, and he had a folding tables, and if you were a first responder, he was out there serving up the fish. And um, Joanne Clevenger got upper line back. And so, as I say, you always remember who came back after the storm. I remember the restaurants first. You brought a lot of the musicians back. It took a while. Then we started doing the, vill the one that Ellis Marcellus put together, the, um, ja the Musician's Village. Um, and then uh, it was actually, if I may say so, the Saints. Because we all, five years after the storm, when the Saints were doing well, every single one of us, whatever our religion, made a deal with our Lord <laughs> that if you let us win this Super Bowl, we'll never ask for anything again. You saw what happened last at the playoffs. Because <laughs> you know, the good Lord said, no, no, I ain't going to make that pass interference call. <laughs> but we were all right with that because we had made that deal. If the Saints won, and then when the Saints won, because Roselle was not thinking of putting the Saints back here, right. when they won, we said, okay, we're going to make it back. And I came back on, I mean, I'd always living back and forth here, but on the... 10th anniversary of the storm, this will be a name dropping thing, I'm sorry to do it, but as vice chair of the recovery authority, I was flying down, you know, with President Obama, because he made the visit for the 10th anniversary. And uh, they said, 
why don't you talk to the press and the Air Force One with him? And the first question is something like, oh, you know, all you Teach for America people came down and now they're taking over um, Marini and you can't get a house there. I said, well, yeah, gentrification's. And then the next one was the same thing. It was like, all right, when the Marini and the Bywater and uh, Treme uh, it's gotten so hipster, aren't you pushing out some of the people who used to live there in the St. Rock Market? Then there was a third question on something else. And the fourth question was, again, St. Rock Market. Is that and I finally said, look, gentrification is a complicated issue, and it can be a problem. But if you told me that 10 years ago, the first three out of four questions we would get is about the gentrification of Bywater, the Marini, Treme, and St. Rock, I'd say, you're out of your mind. They're under eight feet of water. We'll never, we're not sure they'll ever come back. So that was the biggest surprise to me. I'm on the City Planning Commission here now. All we're hearing about is complaints on gentrification. And sometimes I raise my eyes to the good Lord and say, okay, you let us win the Saints game. This is a high-class <laughs> problem to have. And so that surprised me, the gentrification for good and for bad of the city. And uh, I do want to say uh, uh, Paul Prudhomme, was, uh, Kay and, and Paul were, were dear friends of my parents. And um, I remember being in the French Quarter, you know, it was, must have been the September. Yep. You know, went to New York, you know, left New Orleans, went to New York, came back, and walking through the French Quarter and hearing a band play, this was before there was even, you know, lights back on, and uh, I just kind of made my way over to following the sound, and, and Paul uh, was back working at the restaurant, you know, would sit at, was sitting out front, you know, actually being, you know, back on the scene again, yeah, and was hiring a, a trio or a quartet to come play out on the street. Uh, and that was really some of the first music that was getting back into the city was, you know, Paul not only bringing back his chefs and wait staff and whatnot and, you know, was driving people, you know, people were driving to Baton Rouge to get supplies and food every day and bringing back groceries and, um, and I think there would be like one or two items on the menu. It wasn't like a full menu. It was like whatever you, whatever they had that night, that's what, that was what dinner was. Um, and I walked by and I said, Hey, hi, hi, you know, Mr. Paul Prudhomme, you know, it's, a uh, Benji Jaffe, he goes, hey, I know who you are, <laughs> and um, and uh, he kind of just, you know, he just he stopped for a second and just kind of grabbed me by the arm, and he said, um, you got to open your doors, it's family, don't forget it, open your doors, and uh, it was like within a couple months after that that you know you just do it, you don't even think about it, you just you know um, you do it. Um, and you know that was when we were like way below the underdog, you know we didn't know how we were going to survive. You know we still had staff we were paying, we still had musicians who were still trying to find their way back to New Orleans, and uh, you know we families, children, medical centers, schools closed, and he's you know just get your doors open. The rest of you know. One last one. Anyway. So what was your diaspora stories? <laughs> How did you bring people back? We Well, right after the hurricane, I mean, actually I, I can pinpoint the very first moment I ever received a text message. Because um, I was sitting on my stoop over on a dolphin and uh, we only got cell service. It was like, you know, after you know the sun went down, we could kind of get like, you know, a little bit of cell service and it was that that uh, Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, like, you know, we thought we skirted the storm on Sunday, then the levees kind of broke, levees broke on Monday. And then Monday, like late at night, I got my first text message from Lucian Barbarin, whose family was stranded in Shreveport, and their, none of their ATMs worked, they had no cash. And we're usually the first people that, you know, musicians reach out to if there's, you know, an emergency. 
And he said, hey, you know, banks aren't working, ATMs, we don't know our credit cards, where are you? And all of a sudden, I, it just kind of snapped that this was, I, I was gonna, I had to get out of New Orleans to do what I needed to do, and that was to um, start raising awareness and, and um, uh, creating a way to, to, you know, just like we did with the sousaphone, and you know, turn that into to lemonade was direct people's attention to to the music community because I knew that if we could get the music community back to New Orleans, that the music community would bring everybody else back. That it was that that we we we, we knew that there that were the pillars of the community, and not just the musicians, but we also the foundation I, I I founded then the New Orleans Musicians Hurricane Relief Fund. We also we 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 gave grants to, to WWOZ. We gave grants to Offbeat Magazine. We gave grants to Louisiana Music Factory. We knew that they were they were part of our community too, and um, and that's that's that, that I mean yeah. Hey, uh, by the way, just going back to the this, your, your tuba, it, right? It says Preservation Hall Jazz Band on it, right? With the one that was stolen, I mean. Are you trying to make sense of it? Yeah, going, well, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think what what what, what was what was going to happen with it, right? I'm, right? I mean, I, I don't. You know, I mean. New, I, this is, I, I tell this, oh, I tell this to people. New Orleans is like the only city in the world that if you see somebody walking down the street with a tuba, you don't really even bat an eye. You know, it's like really. I mean, you're just like, oh, they're on their way to a, a gig. They're on their way to a parade. They're, you know. But but just to be clear, when I tell the story again later, right? It, it did say on the tuba, Preservation Hall Jazz Band, right? Because that's what it says on your tuba. Very right? clearly. Yes. Okay. I just, yes. <laughs> I, just want, I, just want, I just wanted to know. Thank you. Yes. In fact, I think that that was that was probably the reason at the end of the day that when it got back to us, um, because I, I I have yet to to actually uh, replace the writing when the horn came back to us, the writing was removed. But uh, it was as if um, you know someone had been out tanning or had a tattoo removed. You can still read it. <laughs> you know every every all the the metal underneath uh, where the, the the painting and tape was is still. You know, it's still unscratched, untarnished. Everything else around it's all battered, so you can still clearly see Preservation Hall on it. Um, yeah. Oh. Fair enough. Well, listen, Ben Walter, thank you so much thank you. Thank you. Uh, for joining us. I'm told uh, that uh, downstairs is a reception. You can have a lovely beverage, uh, and thank you very much for <laughs> for coming out. With